One of my proudest moments was when I was in a costume contest. And on the form, it asked for the name of your character. I was Count Dracula. And it asked, what franchise are you from? Well, I was a universal monster. What is a universal monster, you may ask? Well, it's Dracula! Frankenstein! The Mummy! The Invisible Man! The Bride of Frankenstein! The Wolfman! The Phantom of the Opera! And the Creature from the Black Lagoon! There are some other minor ones too, but these are the main eight. I started watching these movies when I was little, and even then, I knew there was something special about them. And as different as Dracula was from the creature, there's something that connects them all and makes them stand out amongst all other movie monsters. I'd like to share with you what I think it is, and explain what is a universal monster. Fittingly, I have narrowed it down to 13 main characteristics. Number one, they're a monster from a horror movie made by Universal Studios anywhere from the 1920s through the 1950s. Number two, they're in black and white. Now, the one exception is the 1943 Phantom of the Opera remake, but the original is really their definitive version. Because we associate black and white as being old, it gives them a haunting quality, as if you found the film in a haunted house. Now in black and white, the lighting plays a bigger role in creating mood, and it makes these monsters look more mysterious, as if they're permanently in the shadows. And because you're not distracted by color, it makes their other qualities stand out more. Bela's eyes were blue, but all you see are their piercing quality which makes him more like a vampire. In the void of color, Boris's eyes seem less alive and more like a living corpse. The black and white makes you believe these actors are really supernatural characters. They're based on a book or myth. Mary, astonishing creature, frightened the thunder, fearful the dark, yet you have written a tale that set my blood in the icy creek. No wonder Murray has refused to publish the book. He says the reading public would be too shocked. It will be published, I think. The publishers did not see my purpose was to write a moral lesson. The punishment that befell on a mortal man who dared to emulate God. Whatever the purpose may have been, my dear, I take great relish in savoring each separate horror. I rue them over on my tongue. Dracula, Frankenstein, the Phantom of the Opera, and the Miserable Man are all based on books. And a lot of the story for the bride comes from the Frankenstein book, too. So they already have the death and complex themes that characters from classic literature naturally have, and were already beloved by readers for decades. However, the mythology behind those monsters has been fascinating people for centuries. Mary Shelley referred to Frankenstein as a modern retelling of the Greek myth Prometheus, and you could see inspiration from the Jewish myth the Golem, the man made out of clay that comes to life. According to film historian David Scowl, there has been no civilization that hasn't had a vampire myth, or at least something similar to a vampire. Stories of werewolves and invisibility go back to ancient Greece, with the story of Zeus turning King Lyceum into a wolf, and the helmet of Hades which turned Perseus invisible. And stories of sea monsters are just as ancient and widespread. So there's a universal appeal to these monsters, which has spanned cultures and centuries. Now the mummy, of course, takes ideas from ancient Egyptian mythology, but was also directly inspired by the then recent myth of the curse of King Tut's tomb, which came about during the 1922 excavation. And the mummy writer, John L. Balderson, was a reporter covering that case. They have clear-cut weaknesses. Now I know that may sound lame, but I'm going to explain why it's awesome. Then Helicine. Now that you have learned what you have learned, it would be well for you to return to your own country. 
I prefer to remain and protect those whom you would destroy. You are too late. My blood now flows through her veins. She shall live through the centuries to come, as I have lived. You escape us, Dracula. We know how to save Miss Mina's soul, if not her life. If she dies by day, but I shall see that she dies by night. I will have Carfax Abbey torn down stone by stone, excavated a mile around. I shall find your earth box and drive that stake through your heart. Come here. Come here. Your will is strong, Van Helsing. More Wolfbane? More effective than Wolfbane, Count. Dracula's afraid of the cross! Frankenstein doesn't do so how with fire! And they even came up with this little figure of Isis to fight against the mummy. These monsters are so powerful, they can wipe out everyone! But this gives the human a fighting chance, which makes it more suspenseful. Is the monster going to get him or not? When Dracula first came out, and Van Helsing stopped Dracula with the cross, the audience burst into applause. That's how exciting it was. Now, it may seem like these monsters go down easy. Silver kills the Wolfman, a wooden stake for Drac. But monsters always die at the end of their movies. So at least this is laid out for you and makes sense as opposed to some of the ways they kill Freddy Krueger in the Nightmare on Elm Street films. So I think this gives it a more satisfying conclusion. They have an unforgettable appearance. When I was little, what made me want to watch these movies was how the monsters looked on the videotape box. And what horror fan doesn't love a great scary makeup? This tradition began with Lon Chaney, who always did his own makeup, and was known as the Man of a Thousand Faces. And his phantom makeup is still horrifying almost a hundred years later. After Long left Universal and died in 1930, makeup artist Jack Pierce became the studio's monster maker. And even Long's son, Lon Chaney Jr., who didn't like Jack Pierce, compared his work to his father's. Jack used basic materials like spirit gum, cotton, collodium, grease paint, and occasionally yak hair, and sometimes would spend up to eight hours layering and building it up. But he created Frankenstein, the bride the mummy, and the wolfman. For his masterpiece, Jack utilized Boris's bone structure, took ideas from Boris Karloff and ideas from the director James Whale, and combined them with his own. He came up with the square forehead because he felt that Dr. Frankenstein, being an untrained surgeon, would take the easiest route and cut straight through the skull and make it like a lid, where he would take the old brain out and put in the new one. By the late 40s, Jack's preferred methods were becoming out of date. Universal sadly fired him, so the more prestigious Bud Westmore and his team did the final monster, the creature from the Black Lagoon. Now Dracula doesn't have an elaborate makeup like Frankenstein, but his costume is just as iconic. The theatrical manager, actor, and writer Hamilton Dean came up with the cape and tuxedo for his Dracula play, which was a major influence on the movie, and the medallion which was a combination of a Turkish coin and the Ottoman Medal of Merit Award, was created specifically for the film. Now the credit for the appearance, or lack thereof, of the Invisible Man goes to John Fulton, the special effects doctor. He used the early version of green screen for the invisibility effects, and they still hold up today, just like the makeups and costumes. They get really cool billing in the opening credits. 
Universal was actually the first studio to give actors on-screen credit, so they were experts at this. First of all, they're the title character. So when you see the box or the poster, you know they're the star. Now I know what you're going to say. But Universal unofficially named him Frankenstein. The Peggy Weblin play, which was a major influence on the film, named him Frankenstein. Plus, there's no way that Edwin Costello made Frankenstein was about meeting the doctor. In the credits, Bela Lugosi plays Count Dracula, which is more dignified than just Dracula. For Frankenstein, Boris Karloff is billed as question mark, making it more mysterious and spooky. When I was little, that made my imagination run away. I even wondered if they cast a real monster. Then Boris Karloff became a horror superstar, so for the Bride of Frankenstein, it's just Karloff, which makes the actor himself sound exciting and scary. And Elsa Lanchester is billed as question mark for the monster's mate. But in a neat twist, she actually gets credit for her other role in the movie, Mary Shelley. For The Invisible Man, Claude Rains' credit has The Invisible One in quotation marks, which is cute and campy and fits the movie's dark humor tone. For The Wolfman, they actually show little clips of the actors in the opening credits, and they save Lon Chaney Jr. for last. You know he's the Wolfman, but they keep you in suspense by not revealing the makeup. And finally, the creature doesn't get any on-screen credit, which goes back to Frankenstein, where it's more mysterious. Is it a real Gill Man playing the part? Doing their billing this way pumps you up to see them. Plus, it makes the actors themselves more mysterious and more monstrous figures. For American audiences, they all come from foreign countries. Your pardon. I dislike to be touched on Eastern prejudice. These movies really got going during the Great Depression. And in those days, people went to the movies to sort of mentally escape the real world. That's why musicals were so popular then. And these monsters did the same thing. Dracula's from Transylvania. Frankenstein and his bride are from Germany. The Invisible Man's from England. The Mummy's from Egypt. The Phantom's from Paris. The Creature's from the Amazon River. And the Wolfman is from this little European village and they keep it so ambiguous that you don't even know what country it is. And in those days, you couldn't just instantly Google a picture of Transylvania. So for most people, these countries were these exotic, romanticized places found only in their imaginations or at the movies. And Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, and Claude Rains were all European, so they had these enchanting accents that just transported you to this dark fairy tale world. Now, nowadays, we can Google what all of these countries really look like. But because the atmosphere is so strong, the characters are so timeless, and because they're all filmed at Universal Studios, they still transport you to the other world. Each actor or actress puts their heart and soul into their character and gives one of the greatest performances of their entire career. Joan Crawford described Lon Chaney as a man mesmerized into his part when he acted as it was if God were working. With the Phantom, he conveyed sadistic cunning and heartbreak with just his facial expressions and body language. With him, you forget you're watching a silent movie because he doesn't need words. Now there has never been an actor so born to play a role as Bela Lugosi was born to play Count Dracula. He was born in Hungary, close to Transylvania and could see Vlad Dracula's castle from his house. Before the movie, he had played Dracula almost a thousand times on stage, and in his words, kept himself worked up to a fever pitch, and would sit in his dressing room and take on, as nearly as possible, the actual attributes of the horrible vampire Dracula. Or oh, did the role depress you? Very much. It haunted me. I often dreamed of the dead. In the morning when I woke up, I was tired and depressed. According to him, for the movie, he worked even more intensely than he did on stage. And he absolutely is Count Dracula. Boris Karloff actually got to develop a character arc for the monster spanning two films, Frankenstein and its direct sequel, The Bride of Frankenstein. First, he's brand new to the world, 
And like Lon Chaney, he's able to convey fear, menace, and happiness without words. In the second one, he adds new dimensions to his portrayal. An animal-like aggression, the ability to speak, and a greater understanding of love and hate in the world. She's alive! Alive! The Bride of Frankenstein! Friend? 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 She hates me. Like others! <laughs> Stay away from that diva! You blow us all to atoms! We belong dead! Unchainy Jr. is also great and so likable and relatable is the kind-hearted but tortured soul Larry Talbot aka the Wolfman. These actors were proud of their roles. Boris called the monster his very best friend. Lon Chaney Jr. called the Wolfman his baby. And Bela Lugosi named one of his dogs Dracula. And his son called their house the Dracula House. Now out of all these monster stars, Claude Rains probably had the most successful mainstream career. He was the first actor to get paid a million dollars. But no role highlighted his magnificent voice the way the Invisible Man did. Elsa Lanchester became a horror icon with about five minutes of screen time as the bride. And as man in the suit as he could have been, Rico Browning used this unique swimming style for the creature where he really seemed like a gill man. And at almost 90, he's still going to horror conventions. They approach their roles the same way you would approach playing Hamlet and all of them became horror icons because of it. They have romantic interests. How's my spooky pooky? This is part of giving depth to these characters. They don't want to be alone. And it's part of that fairy tale quality. In the documentary, The Opera Ghost, A Phantom Unmasked, Scott McQueen says, if one theme recurs in the canon of Universal Studios horror, it is the timeless legend of Beauty and the Beast. Frankenstein, the Phantom of the Opera, and the Creature from the Black Lagoon all have a girl they're in love with, but because they're so ugly, they're always rejected, and you feel for them. Now, Dracula is the opposite. Bela Lugosi was the innovator of the sexual element of the character. On the surface, these handsome, charming, and lures women in, and by the time they realize he's the beast, they're already under his spell. In The Mummy, Imhotep is in love with Helen because she is the reincarnation of his lost love, Anaxanamen, and his goal is to make her remember her past life. This concept was later integrated in not only mummy movies, but many vampire movies as well. Now my favorite romance is actually with the Invisible Man. The formula that makes him invisible also causes madness, but he loves Flora so much that when he's with her, he tries to fight it off but can't. I knew you would come to me, Flora. I wanted to come back to you, my darling. I failed. I meddled in things that man must leave alone. Oh. Most monsters go after women, but with them, it's part of the tragedy of their characters, and they'll never have the love that they want. They're outsiders, but also the character you identify with. These monsters look different from everybody else, they act different from everybody else, and the people in town are either afraid of them or trying to kill them. They have no hope of fitting in. But haven't we all, at different times of our lives, felt like we don't fit in? And that's how you can relate to these monsters. Now, when I was little, I used to love to stay up late, so I wanted to be Dracula. And I love swimming, so I wanted to be the creature so I could swim all the time. And who hasn't thought about being invisible? Kids seem to instantly identify Frankenstein as being like a big child. 
He's new to the world, doesn't understand the rules, just like they are. And when they made the movie, Mae Clark, who was an adult playing Elizabeth, was terrified of the makeup. And Boris had to keep wiggling his little finger to remind her that it's just Boris. But Marilyn Harris, who played the little girl, just instantly bonded with Boris Karloff and Frankenstein makeup. The Wolfman is another one that's easy for kids to relate to. From everything I've learned about Lon Chaney Jr., he sounds like a big kid. Even when they made Ghost of Frankenstein, he bought all the kids ice cream. And I think that's why he was so great at playing Lemmy and of Mice and Men. And it shines through in his Larry Talbot. You feel that gentleness. And his situation is very kid-like too, even though he's an adult. Because part of the plot is him trying to tell his dad that he's a werewolf, and his dad not believing him. Presses the chair. No one can get no out. Now you'll see this evil thing you conjured up is only in your mind. But you're going to stay with me, aren't you? <laughs> no, I've got to go, Larry. These people have a problem. You must make your own fight. But we'll settle this tonight. Dad, take the king with you. What do I want with a king? Please, just take it with you. Please. All right. When you're 12 or 13, you could even see the wolf change as a metaphor for puberty. I know I certainly could. So I was, and still am, able to see myself in all of these monsters. And I think that's why I'm so attached to them. They're easy to imitate. I used to love playing and acting out as these monsters when I was a kid. And through doing these videos and cosplaying as Dracula at horror conventions, I still do it. And anyone can talk like Dracula, or walk like Frankenstein. It's a testament to how iconic these monsters are, that anyone could do them even if you haven't seen the movie. And it's a testament to how much personality the actors brought to their roles. Now if you're looking to do a brighter Frankenstein, I suggest the hiss. <coughs> and Elsa Lanchester got the idea, because her and her husband Charles Lawton used to feed the geese. And if you got too close, the geese would go <coughs> at you. These standout characteristics is part of what makes the Universal Monsters so much fun. They've inspired other monsters. There have been so many remakes, reimaginings, homages, and parodies of these movies, some of which have become classics in their own right. And as different as some of the remakes are, they've all taken some inspiration from the original. The 2020 version of Dracula is charming and sexy, which is taken from Bela Lugosi. However, they've also inspired original creations. The creator of the horror soap opera Dark Shadows, Dan Curtis, was inspired to create Barnabas Collins because of how scared he was of Bela Lugosi when he was a kid. There are shots and ideas in Jaws that are almost identical to the creature from the Black Lagoon. And The Shape of Water is a romantic retelling of the creature from the Black Lagoon. Rocky from the Rocky Horror Picture Show was inspired by Frankenstein. And Sally from The Nightmare Before Christmas even has scars like the bride. With no novels behind them, the Wolfman and the Mummy have inspired whole subgenres of horror stories. There would be no monsters. There would be no Count Van Count. Nor would there be a Count Chocula or a Frankenberry. So even breakfast wouldn't be the same without the Universal Monsters. You always see them, especially around Halloween. Aside from The Wizard of Oz, I cannot think of another live-action franchise from that era that is still as much a part of our culture as the Universal Monsters are. The movies are still regularly shown on TV on the Spanguli Show. There's a place sort of near me called Haunted Trails that has them prominently displayed. And I've even been to an arcade with a creature from the Black Lagoon pinball machine. So you can spot them here and there all year round, but they're really happening during Halloween. During last year's Halloween, Hot Topic sold a Dracula bobblehead in Bela Lugosi's likeness. Walgreens had exclusive Universal Monster action figures. There are Universal Monsters on Halloween cards, candy bags. There are Universal Monster Halloween decorations and Halloween costumes. And there's even a Universal Monster haunted house at Universal Studios. Just last night, I saw the movies prominently displayed at Walmart.
I grew up in the 90s, and I remember one year Burger King had Universal Monster Kids Meal Toys. The creature could even go in the bathtub. One year my mom got me Universal Monster Valentine's cards, and she even got me the Universal Monster postage stamps, which was the first time I ever saw the actors without makeup. So Universal Monster isn't just a franchise. It stands for something. And you may have points that I missed, but I think we all agree that if ever someone deserves to be called a classic movie monster, it's Dracula. Frankenstein. The Mummy. The Invisible Man. The Bride of Frankenstein. The Wolfman. The Phantom of the Opera. And the Creature from the Black Lagoon. I know I did that earlier, but a great cast is worth repeating. <laughs>